If there's one way to make a statement at graduation, it's with a handmade outfit with the theme of your own degree, in my case, astrophysics. Join me as I make this wonderful cosmic waistcoat with a touch of Rococo slash Victorian design and construction. In terms of pattern, I did say I would do the shawl collar vest that was quite popular um, during the Victorian era, um, specifically the pattern from Black Snail. But I've kind of decided against it since between sketching out the pattern and designing it and now, mainly because I've made quite a few waistcoats between then and I've decided that I really prefer a more Baroque slash Rococo style of garment. So I've actually drafted out the front for, and I've used it really successfully for quite a lot of patterns now. Um, this is based off of just old drafting methods. I'll see if I can link some sort of resource um, down below, but it was mainly just a bit of trial and error. So this is one of the my favourite garments that I've made with this pattern. Um, and yes, it, all the strawberries were hand embroidered. The trimming wasn't, but you know, we, we do what we can. So what's in what I like about this, it's a bit similar to a modern waistcoat, um, but whereas a modern waistcoat wouldn't have a collar, and I'm a little bit undecided on the collar as of now, but I might add it. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll figure that out later on. But with a modern waistcoat, um, usually you just have the shoulder and then you get a straight seam down to the middle um, where you attach the buttons down there. But with a more Rococo style, slash Regency as well, I'm just saying so many words I'm trying not to confuse you I'm sorry if I do um, we've also got this extra bit that sticks out and so when you wear quite a nice fluffy shirt like uh, they used to and maybe even a cravat or a tie this would sort of sort of look a bit loose and sort of poof out a bit and it despite it being a very nice and structured and formal garment it sort of gives a more laid back um, style as well which I think is really nice so essentially for this waistcoat I'm just going to be basically making a carbon copy of this, but with some fancier fabrics, which I will talk about in a second. Um, this is slightly different to a regular Rococo slash Baroque-ish waistcoat in that, yes, the top part does look very much like um, the style of the times, um, whereas the bottom bit is a little bit shorter, a bit more, I guess you could call it Regency um, in the way, because uh, a lot of Baroque and Rococo waistcoats would actually go down quite a bit and have a little cutout. I'll pick, I'll pop some pictures up as I'm talking, um, hopefully some public domain ones as well so I don't get in trouble, um, so you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, this is essentially the style of waistcoat that I quite like. It's a little bit of every century, I guess. Um, but yeah, it works really nicely. So what I'll do is, I've already got the front pattern for this. The collar is easy to draft, it's just a rectangle. And then the back as well, I'll take a copy of that. I usually just trace this directly onto the pattern, onto the fabric. But um, yeah, it's just a simple back pattern, which just is quite a bit wider than my own body, mainly so that it can be adjustable and essentially wearable for many, many years. For this vest, I decided to go all out with some very luxurious fabrics. For my fashion layer, that's the nice stuff that everyone sees, I chose to have two layers, a polycotton blend which has a subtle sheen, and a gorgeous celestial sequined and embroidered tool. This was so expensive, so I only got one yard, and I think that should be more than enough. For my lining and back, I used a simple black voile, and the interlining was made out of leftover green twill. For embellishments, I thought I'd pick between these two buttons, but I actually decided to use clasps instead, and some lurex piping for some extra decor. Very lavish. I first cut the interlining out of the twill for both the front pieces, and marked out where the pockets will go. This is the most important piece of the garment in my opinion, it allows for sturdiness regardless of your fashion fabric, and lets you based on different layers to achieve a clean look, you'll see that later. The interlining was cut with no seam allowance. I 
I then basted or pad stitched all three layers together. The reason for this is to make sure none of the layers slip and warp as I'm working with the pieces. This was some very slippery stuff and I wanted my pieces looking nice and flat. I then cut both of the fashion fabrics with quite large seam allowances. I was a little unsure as to how much they would fray at the edges, so I cut a little larger just to make sure. I also cut out the pieces so that each side would have a very different pattern, since the fabric isn't symmetrical even if I tried making them look similar. It would be slightly off and I think that's worse than making them wildly different. Here is the result of the pad stitching. You can see that all three layers behave as one, and this will make everything else from now on much easier to do. Next up is to make the pockets. Please don't hate me for this, but these are actually fake pockets. This is the only time I've made fake waistcoat pockets, I promise. But to be honest, I never work with such a textured and very odd fabric, such as sequined um, mesh. So for this specific project, I thought I'd make things just a little simpler. What I'm doing here is actually making welt pockets. These are really common on jackets and waistcoats, and you've probably got a garment with one of these on. To do this, I placed the rectangles on the vest right sides together, and then hand stitched a rectangle. The inside of this rectangle was then cut into, which is quite scary when you're making it, and then the pocket was pulled through to the other side. The bottom part of the fabric under the rectangle then gets folded up to make the welt pocket. If you're making a real one, you'd stitch the back of the pocket and then you're actually done. I know it's hard to see here in this video. All I'm doing now is hand tacking the pocket down to make it look as flat as possible. I also removed some of the inner sequins to make sure it doesn't really bubble up on the inside. So quick in-person update, I've got both the pockets done. We've got the first one over here, please focus, there we go. And actually, one thing I did is when I finished the pocket, I saw the piping and I thought I'd put it together, sort of see if it would look nice to top it off, because it does kind of, it is quite invisible without the um, piping and it actually looks quite nice in person. It matches with the silver thread um, which is used quite heavily in the embroidery, so actually it does work pretty well. Yeah, so I'm really happy with it. There we go, it's focusing. I think it looks quite nice. I like how, um, yeah, it's not quite symmetrical. It couldn't be anyway because of the way that, um, I don't have two symmetrical bits of fabric, so it wouldn't have been possible. So I do quite like that I've shifted it over and so they, they don't look... Um, like they've been tried to be symmetrical, but they they didn't quite it didn't quite work out, which I think which I think looks terrible. So <laughs> I'm glad I cut them out very differently. Um, so yeah, the next step will actually be um, so you can see I've got the interlining over here and then the bits of fashion fabric. My next steps are actually going to be to finish off and base these edges inside into the interlining, so that. I'll, I'll essentially be finishing the edges and I'll do that all throughout the bottom with the exception of this bit over here. So all the way around here, um, not, well maybe I should, I 
yeah, I'll probably finish up the shoulder as well and the armhole. I'll leave this bit untouched and also just a little bit here so I have a bit of moving room. This is somewhat where historical sewing and modern sewing really differ. Here I'm actually trimming the excess seam allowance and stitching the front edges down to the interlining with a permanent basting stitch, making sure to only put my needle through to the green interlining and go no further. With a modern vest, you'd actually do as much work as you can with the sewing machine, but you can't really attach things in this manner because the stitching would be visible on both sides, so instead you'd sew the front with the lining uh, right sides together and then flip it inside out. Here, instead I attach the lining separately with a whip stitch, which you'll see later. What I'm doing is more in line with pre-Victorian methods. In fact, in this era, we'd actually finish each piece, so the two front pieces and then the back pieces, separately and then stitch them together. It's only really with the Victorian era, era and more importantly the increasing usage of the sewing machine that we're seeing things being sewn right sides together as the more common method of construction. Oh my goodness, look at all of these sequins I've trimmed off. Such a mess. <laughs> Anyways, next up I cut the front lining and both of the back pieces. Um, this completes all of the cutting I need for this project, which is great because I actually hate this part of sewing. Now at this point I think I started to feel a little unwell, so to save a little energy I stitched the back armholes together, as in I stitched the lining and the fashion layers together, and then I also stitched the bottom edge and then turned the back inside out. So I've got my back piece over here, you've got the shoulder, then you've got the neck over here, and then the other shoulder down here and it goes down to the back. So what we do is instead of doing it the modern way, which if I had not tacked this down we could push them together, back stitch, and then open them out, which actually isn't, it would be a lot of faffing around with uh, this bit and then folding that over and f finishing it that way, I don't want to deal with that. So instead what we do is keep both sides together and then we just lay them on over here so that they're, you know, there's a little bit of overlap, so just over there. And then on the front side, um, we'll pin this down, but then on the front side you'll see it looks uh, can you focus please? Nope. Anyways, I'll show you on the front actually. It will look a little bit like this over there. So you just pop, pop that one on top and there's that overlap. And then from here you do very, very strong, small and even whip stitches. Um, so you're basically felling it into place. So you'll just go down into this fabric, come back up through this fabric, poke it out poke the needle out and then down again and you do this quite a lot of times you want a really nice and strong stitch and then when we flip this back over again <laughs> there we go if we pretend for a second that our fabric is nice and secure you might even see 
you probably should you'll see the stitches on this side as well then we'll go and grab our lining is that the right one yes it is well they're reversible anyway it doesn't really matter and then when it comes to attaching the lining which i think yeah i'll do that probably in the next stage we'll just fold over that bit of the lining over here and then whip that into place quite strongly as well but we'll make sure that when we whip it into place uh, I can feel the bottom of the the top of the uh, fashion fabric here the fa this fancy little bit feel it over here when we put it into place we'll just narrowly miss it here and so there'll be the fashion fabric should be just slightly larger over here and that makes sure that the stitches catch through to the lining and onto this little bit over here but not right through to the front and while with the tool fabric it doesn't actually matter that much you can't see the stitches when it comes to something a little bit more you know fancy like silk satin that does make a big difference and while I'm at it because it will be easier to do this as I'm going along I'll also finish off the neck seam so that will be mean I'll fold over this edge fold over this other edge pin them down Oops. can you see that well there's not much to see anyway pin them down like that and then stitch them from the outside with you know a felling stitch once again or a whip stitch sorry and then once that's done I'll probably do the sides in the exact same manner yeah and then I will just finish off attaching the lining completely and then that actually should yeah that should actually be done then all that will be left is to see if i want to decorate the edges with piping actually yeah i'll do that while i attach the lining and see if i want piping so these dogs going crazy outside i'll then attach some uh what do you call them not tassels but the knot things things that you knot at the back the adjustable thingamabobs the strings or whatever I'll attach those and just match them up exactly like with my previous waistcoats and then it'll just be buttons which oh god I am dreading making those buttonholes. Okay I've just finished doing the sides and the shoulders as well I'll just show you how it looks so here it looks pretty clean you can't really see much it is getting dark outside so I think this will be the last thing I film today and then on the inside yeah, you can only see two lines of stitches over there. So, if now I've also done that side as well. So before I was gonna do the other side, I figured since I've got some thread on my needle and I'm on this side, there are some really aggressive dogs outside again. <laughs> right, while I'm over here, I figured I might actually add the piping now, so... Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, you've still got quite a lot of, a lot of this yet left. Um, I'll add it to the front of the waistcoat's arm side over here. So, what I'll do, please focus, is before we roll this over and whip stitch it, instead what we're going to do is you can just place this on at the edge so if I fold it over it will just peek out a little bit and then simultaneously once that's been once you move that there you can then whip stitch that through the piping and through just the, the little folded in edges there to capture everything in all at once and so I'll do that on that side and the other side as well and I think that's it oh yeah I'll also do just the bottom hem as well and then that will be everything done the only thing left will be the buttonholes and the ties so we're actually almost done with the waistcoat now here I am whip stitching the lining to the front pieces only inserting my needle as far as the interlining once that's done the front is much prettier and is basically finished
here I'm repeating this for the other side too. The shoulder is already stitched up so I'm just whip stitching the front to the back and then the lining to the back to encase all of the edges. From here on it's just a case of whip stitching the lining to the front as before while also attaching the shoulder piping. Here's a little try on just to make sure it fits, which it does. Not gonna lie, it actually looks pretty cool with the orange howry for some reason. I think I might make a waistcoat to complement it sometime soon. There we go, look at that! Oh my goodness! It looks so nice. I'm really glad I put the piping on at the front as well. I think it just adds a little extra uh, depth to the waistcoat itself. I'm really, really pleased with this. Right, so my next steps here, let's zoom out and look at it in all its glory. Yeah, you can actually see the pockets as well, thanks to the piping, so I'm glad I did that. Okay, next steps will be to add those tassels. I'm going to then add some closures. Now, I've decided actually, because the buttonholes will potentially damage the fabric a bit and we do have quite a few layers as well given that this uh, lace fabric needs a backing. I'm not too keen on actually making buttonholes so I instead I went looking around my um, button bowl I guess it's just a strawberry bowl anyways <laughs> I'm getting so distracted and I found I remember I bought these quite a while ago and I never used them I found these really nice clasps so I've got those two over there I've got a couple more there we go and I thought they looked quite nice they are a little bit small but I think it's a really nice way if I attach them on that is one squeaky bike if I attach them on, I'll just be sewing through all the layers and making a couple knots. I won't actually be damaging any of the fabric, and I figured that might actually be the best way. They are a little bit on the small side, and I do only have a few. Yeah, you can see it in the middle, but they're kind of hidden, which in a way I think works quite well because then it sort of blends in with the fabric and you're not really taking away from it. Okay, we are almost there. This is arguably the worst part and would be much faster with the sewing machine that is right next to me, but I forgot. But here I am making four ties for the back. These are just very long thin rectangles that I've just folded twice and sewn. I do not recommend sewing these inside out and then turning them right side out unless you have a bodkin because this is basically impossible. I'm placing them just under the armhole curves and at the largest chest point and the waist. These will make the waistcoat fully adjustable and thus making it wearable regardless of any weight fluctuations. The final step was to attach the clasps. I think these were the best option since I was really concerned that the buttonholes would damage the cotton silk layer too much. Once I attached these we were ready for the final reveal. Well, I am really happy with this waistcoat, and I'm so excited to show this off at graduation this Wednesday. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you're interested in space content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and congratulations if you're graduating.